when I talk about e-cigarettes, um, I, I call it Back to the Future because I'm, you guys all remember the movie Back to the Future where, where uh, Marty McFly gets in a DeLorean and goes back 30 years. And, and I feel like when I'm talking about the e-cigarette issue that, uh, that I got in a DeLorean and went back 30 or 40 years because a lot of the arguments that we're having today about are they safe and, and are, are we infringing upon freedom if we regulate them and talking about ec the economy and all this other stuff, it's exactly the arguments we had about secondhand smoke beginning in the 70s and, and in California through about the mid-90s when the issue pretty much got settled here. And uh, the, the, the big thing that's different from back uh, when we were debating the issues around secondhand smoke is that the whole e-cigarette issue is evolving a lot faster than, than happened when we were talking about secondhand smoke and clean indoor air because the science is developing way faster. Uh, you know, the first evidence that uh, smoking caused disease at all didn't appear until about 1980. Uh, lung cancer in, um, in, uh, in uh, 81, heart disease in about 85, and um, breast cancer maybe in about in the early 90s. And, you know, we really didn't start getting a lot of legislation for a good 10 years after that. And the fight, I mean, here in California, this is a kind of, I mean, there's work to be done, but we're, we are have very strong legislation. About 60% of the country is now covered with California-style legislation. But with e-cigarettes, it's all happening very, very fast. And there are several myths out there about e-cigarettes that are animating the debate. Uh, the first one is that they're substantially safer than cigarettes. And a number that you hear, and I'll talk more about this later, thrown around is that e-cigarettes are 95% safer than cigarettes. And, and that's just hogwash. Um, you know, the more we learn, the more dangerous they look, the more uh, every week more research is coming out about more bad things that they're doing. Now, the second thing is that they help smokers quit smoking. One of the uh, big arguments you heard against uh, most recently Proposition C here in San Francisco, which was an effort by Julie Cigarettes to roll back all the city's legislation in this area, was that, well, if you make these things harder for people to get, then smokers won't use them to quit. And I'm going to show you that they don't help people quit, at least not as consumer products. And then they say, well, they don't appeal to kids. This is the kind of the most outrageous thing. But several years ago, and I really wish I had put this, kept this in a calendar somewhere, the two guys who started Juul, and I think they were still graduate students at Stanford, came by to see me and said, we have this great idea for a new product that generates a nicotine aerosol without setting the tobacco on fire. And we think this is going to revolutionize smoking and get rid of cigarettes and help people quit smoking. And, you know, it's not a completely crazy idea because the way a cigarette works is you take the, the tobacco and you set it on fire and then the fire generates an aerosol of ultrafine particles that you breathe in deep into your lungs. They go from your lungs to your left heart to your brain, and you get this big blast of nicotine. And nicotine is the addictive drug in, in tobacco products. And the thing that makes it addictive is it, the molecule is shaped a lot like something called acetylcholine, which is the chemical that nerve cells communicate with each other. So the nicotine kind of fakes out your nervous system and stimulates it. And I said, well, you know, you know with an e-cigarette, and I'll talk a little in a minute about how, exactly how they work, but they generate the aerosol without setting anything on fire. And so you don't get all of those icky combustion products. And so it's not insane to think 
that e-cigarettes would be substantially safer than cigarettes. But like a lot of things that seem reasonable, it turns out that's wrong, that they're really quite dangerous. But I said to these guys, well, this is an interesting idea, but you're going to have two problems. One is what's called dual use. That is, people who use the e-cigarettes and keep smoking cigarettes at the same time, which has turned out to be the dominant use pattern. And the other problem is kids. This could be very attractive to kids, and what are you going to do about that? And, and their answer was, well, you know, no kid would care about these things. And of, and, and of course, that's not true, and it's largely not true because of the way they sell them. The original e-cigarettes that came on the market in about 2007 were, came in from China. They were invented there as an alternative to smoking. And for a few years, e-cigarette companies were actually competing with cigarette companies. But now all the e-cigarette companies, are the big ones, are all owned by cigarette companies, by Philip Morris, British American Tobacco, which owns R.J. Reynolds, Imperial Tobacco, Japan Tobacco, and this is some of the different products that are out there. And, and so really when you talk about e-cigarettes, you're talking about big tobacco. Now how do e-cigarettes work? This is an e-cigarette, it kind of looks like a pen. And if you look down at the bottom, this is a battery. And then this one has a switch to turn it on and off. A lot, some of them are pressure actuated. When you suck on them, they start. And then right here, there's a little uh, a reservoir, a chamber, and you put e-liquid in it. And the e-liquid is a mixture of propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, nicotine, and flavoring agents. And then inside there, there's a wick, kind of like a candle wick, except thicker. And wrapped around the wick is a little electrical coil, kind of like a little toaster coil. And then what you do is you, at, you turn it on, the wick heats up, the, the, the or pardon me, the, um, the coil heats up, the wick gets hot, the wick is soaked in the e-liquid, and that generates the aerosol that you breathe in. And so you, you get this aerosol that of ultrafine particles that carries the nicotine down into your lungs and up to your brain without fire. Now, th there are a whole bunch of different kinds of e-cigarettes. The original e-cigarettes that came on the market were shown up here at the top. They're called cigalikes, likes, because they look like cigarettes. They were meant to mimic cigarettes. Um, the battery is is in here and, the, and they're disposable and they often even had a little light that would go on. And then they came up with rechargeable ones. This is the, pot, the pen system, the third generation system. If you look carefully, you can see the wick here. This is the chamber where you put the liquid. Then there are things called mods or for modifiable ones. And these are like do-it-yourself e-cigarettes where you can go to a vape shop and buy the battery and the coil and the tank all separately and put them together. And in fact, now there's like a million different e-cigarettes. I mean, these are all e-cigarettes. And some of them look like flash drives and some of them look like magic markers and some of them, you know, look like pens. And this has actually become a real problem for parents and for teachers because they, you know, they didn't even know what these things were. But they all basically work the same way. And also, uh, you can vape marijuana in these things. Uh, the, the solvents which are used in the marijuana vapes are different than the one the nic nicotine uses propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin. The marijuana ones use because marijuana is, or THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, doesn't dissolve in water. You use a more oily based, but it's basically the same thing. And in fact, uh, you can buy, uh, the, the, you see that black thing there, that's called a pod, which works with the new Juul, with Juul and the new pod system. So you can buy a cannabis pod or a THC pod that will plug into a Juul. 
And this is a jewel. This is uh, a company based here in San Francisco. And if you look at this thing, all the the battery and the electronics are in here. And then this little black thing is, this is the pod. You could replace those and you buy them pre-filled with, naked, with uh, the e-liquid. So the heater and the... Um, or the coy or the wick are in there and then you plug it in and then if you look on the bottom here you can see that there's little electrical contacts you can pl plug this into a usb port to charge it up and jewel uh, has been immensely successful especially with kids and i think it's been successful with kids for three reasons the first reason is it doesn't look like a cigarette you know, we've spent the last 30 or 40 years convincing everybody that cigarettes were disgusting. Kids think they're disgusting. And so if you give them an e-cigarette that looks like a cigarette, it looks disgusting. But this is sleek, it's modern, it's electronic. So the, the fact that the product, you know, it's a brilliant piece of industrial design. The second thing is they did an absolutely brilliant social marketing campaign. Uh, Jewel did very little conventional advertising, but you read about and you hear about influencers and, and uh, putting stuff on Instagram, and this is part of uh, Jewel's campaign. And you just, you know, they say, well, this is directed at middle-aged smokers who want to quit. And, and I mean, it's just ridiculous. And in fact, the Attorney General of California is suing Jewel over their, as our, and, and uh, also Massachusetts, and now I think a couple other states, over their marketing campaigns. And if you if you read the lawsuits, which are very carefully researched, I mean, Jewel worked very hard to develop a campaign that would go viral and reach kids. And in fact, Reuters has done a series of really good investigative pieces about Jewel. And, you know, when they were designing it, designing their marketing campaign, the initial company they hired actually came in with a campaign directed at kind of middle-aged smokers. And they said, we don't want that. And they came up with this campaign. And then the third thing is, is there was actually a big technological breakthrough in Juul. And that is the way, the, the, the chemical form of the nicotine, which is delivered. And this, the, the one here uh, closer to me this is a, a traditional pen system, or a third generation system. And this is the nicotine molecule. And, um, and, and if you use the older e-cigarette systems or conventional cigarettes, you get what's called free base nicotine. So you're, you're, you're uh, taking the nicotine and it's very basic, it's very alkaline. And it, it's very hard to inhale. Because if, if you make the dose of nicotine too high, it will trigger a gag reflex, and you just can't get it down. And what Juul realized, and they did that in part by studying early old tobacco industry research that we have available here at UCSF, they put benzoic acid in the liquid. And if you remember your high school chemistry, the acid donates a hydrogen molecule, which is which you see up here, and it binds to 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 the to the salt and makes the takes the salt from being very alkaline to being a little bit acid. And that makes it much easier to inhale. So the jewel and and now all the other companies have copied the nicotine salt technology they can deliver much higher dose of nicotine per puff than you could get down with a conventional cigarette. So there are these three things. The product design is beautiful and very appealing to kids. The marketing was brilliantly executed to reach kids. And the, and the nicotine form in the Juul is much, it's higher, easier to deliver a higher dose so you can get the kids addicted faster. And in fact, another thing that came out uh, in, in some of the Reuters investigations was that there was debate inside Juul about 
programming the device, because it's a digital device, to limit how fast kids could, could get the nicotine, and they decided not to do that, because they wanted to make this as addictive as fast as possible. And whereas with a conventional cigarette, from the time a kid takes their first puff until they become a fully addicted smoker is typically a couple of years, two or three years. With Juul, I haven't seen any formal studies, but if you just talk to kids, it's like two or three months or maybe even weeks. And so these kids get really addicted very quickly. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. And so this is actually from the Juul patent. And remember I talked about you take the nicotine you know, from into your lungs, to your left heart, to your brain very quickly. And, you, and this, the black line here is the, the, the nicotine levels in the blood for people smoking conventional cigarettes. And you can see it builds up very fast. And then it, it also decays quickly. And when the level gets down below some threshold, that's when somebody takes another puff. And then for Juul, uh, the, you see it pretty much mimics a cigarette. And in fact, the, more re the later generation Juuls actually exceed a cigarette in terms of the nicotine spike. This is an older e-cigarette, probably a first generation e-cigarette, and you can see that the nic you just don't get the same blast of nicotine. And part of that is it's harder to inhale because it's not a salt, and also the particle sizes of the aerosol were bigger, so people tended to, they were more like smoking a cigar, where in, with a cigar you absorb a lot of the nicotine through your cheeks, and then it gets into your bloodstream, and it has to go through your whole circulation before it gets to your brain, so you don't get quite the big blast. And, and this really did work. This is marketing data through through 2018, and Juul is the red line, and you can see that they just clobbered their competitors. And, uh, you know, it was making money hand over fist and, uh, um, you know, and, and freaking out parents and the schools. And, in fact, it's interesting because I've been working on tobacco for a very long time, and it used to be the schools were kind of a black hole on tobacco. The teachers just didn't want to be bothered with it. Uh, I was on an, the oversight committee for the state's tobacco program for several years, and I kept trying to take all the money away from the schools because the, they, they just weren't interested in dealing with tobacco and give, put the money somewhere where people were. That's not the case with these cigarettes because the schools are really on the front lines on this because... They're, you know, they're, these, they're confiscating these things every day. The kids can't go into the bathrooms. There are schools where they're locking the bathrooms or taking the doors off the stalls. I was up in North Dakota about a year ago, and, you know, they were, you know, up there, like in a lot of rural places, like high school sports are a very big deal. And, like, I can't remember... I think it was a state basketball championships, and one of the two schools lost their center the day before the big game because they caught him with a jewel. And, and the schools are just loading up with these things that they're confiscating, and they don't know what to do with them because it's like e-waste soaked in a pesticide. You can't just throw these things in the trash. So that's kind of what happened to the market. But, but you still hear this argument, and it's, you know, very out there, and you're, you're you know, uh, there, there's, the governor has proposed a tax on, um, on nicotine in e-cigarettes, so I'm sure you're going to be hearing this, and they're going to say, well, but wait, these are these miracle drugs, these products are going to help all the smokers quit, and you know, smoking is terrible, and, and you know, I, if you go on the internet and look me up, you'll see that I'm an absolutely horrible human being, and I want all the smokers to die, and and all of that. But, you know, the, the debate, and this is a little bit technical, but the debate over what effect the e-cigarettes have on quitting is really two discussions that tend to get mixed up with each other. And one of them is if you think of an e-cigarette as a medicine. So 
like you've all heard of the patch and the gum, nicotine replacement therapy. And the argument is, well, because the, the, the e-cigarette, it's like smoking a cigarette behaviorally. You get the big blast of nicotine. So this might be a better way to get people off cigarettes than the existing therapies. And, and so, you know, in that context, the question is, well, is an e-cigarette something a doctor ought to be prescribing as a way to help people quit smoking? And if, if you want to register a medicine... You go to the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and, and the FDA is a gigantic organization, and the place in the FDA you go is something called the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR. They're the people who decide what can be sold as a drug, what the indications for using it are, who ought to use it, what claims can be made about it. And the... The standard that, that by law, CEDAR uses to decide whether to approve a drug is, is it safe and effective? That is, does it do what it claims to do? That's efficacy. And then also, is, it, is, is, is whatever side effects it has, you know, small enough that the drug is safe enough to use? And, and the... the uh, research method, which is used to, to evaluate drugs, is something called a randomized clinical trial. And have you guys heard about randomized clinical trials? Yeah. So I, anybody want me to explain what a randomized clinical trial is? Good. Okay, so you use a randomized clinical trial. And I mean, I teach statistics, and that is the best way to evaluate a medicine. But there's another use. So a lot of the debate is talking about e-cigarettes as medicine. But in fact, the way they're actually out there in the marketplace is they're there as consumer products. If you go to a 7-Eleven or a vape shop or, you know, or, uh, um, you know, some other store and pick them up, there's no doctor there saying, like, we're going to use help this and counsel you to quit smoking. It's a consumer product, and the part of the FDA that, that decides, or at least is supposed to decide, whether or not a t tobacco product can be sold in the United States is something called the Center for Tobacco Products. And the, the legal standard there is appropriate for the protection of public health. And what that means is it's a more complicated standard than safe and effective because when the Congress passed the law giving the FDA authority over e-cigarettes, they, um, they said, well, we all know that these tobacco products are, are you know, in inherently dangerous, but the question is if we let a new product onto the market, are we going to, is the society overall going to be better? And, and there are two parts of that question. One is the specific toxicity of the product. Is it more or less dangerous than a cigarette or another product on the market? But the other thing is how do people actually use it? What effect does it have on people quitting, smoking? What does it have on kids starting? And for that, the, the, the best standard to use scientifically are what are called observational studies. That's where you go out into the real world and you just look and see if, if you, how are, you know, whereas in a randomized controlled trial, you would take people who want to quit smoking and you randomly assign one group to the control group, one group to e-cigarettes, and then you follow them forward in time and see if the e-cigarette users quit more. In an observational study, you just go out and look in the population of whoever's using them, however they're using them, and ask the question, are smokers who are using e-cigarettes more or less likely to stop smoking than smokers who don't use e-cigarettes? And so if we go to the randomized controlled trials, this is probably still the best paper done that came out a little over a year ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, a randomized trial of e-cigarettes versus nicotine replacement therapy. 
that is using e-cigarettes as a medicine, and they found that they worked, that, that the, the people who were randomized to get e-cigarettes together with intensive counseling and follow-up actually quit more. And this got a huge amount of press, and the e-cigarette advocates always are talking about it. And it's a, it's a perfectly nice scientific study, but it's a study of a clinical intervention, not a consumer product. And it was accompanied with four weeks of intensive smoking cessation counseling, which is probably more than any patient at UCSF usually gets. And now we, we just finished doing a big study, what's called a meta-analysis. Have you heard about meta-analyses? Yes? Okay. We just finished the meta-analysis, and we found nine randomized controlled trials, which I'll show you in a minute, and which showed efficacy, but one cautionary thing was at the end of a year, the people who had been randomized to get e-cigarettes were still, they'd stopped smoking, but they were still using the e-cigarettes. Whereas the people who'd ra been randomized to the conventional therapies, nicotine replacement therapy, only 9% of them were still using the nicotine. So I think, well, here's, here's the meta-analysis. So these are the nine studies we found. And do you know how to read this graph? Or Okay. So what you do when you do a, a study like this, a clinical trial in this case, is, is you take the people who are in the, in the experimental group who got the e-cigarettes, and you, I'm simplifying this a bit, but you, you say, what's the likelihood they quit smoking? And then you take the people in the control group who are not who are who are getting conventional therapy and what's the chances they would quit and then you take that ratio so if if the e-cigarettes had no effect on quitting that ratio would be 1 the people who got the e-cigarettes would their likelihood of quitting is the same as the people who didn't and that's 1 if they depressed quitting then the ratio would be less than 1 and if they helped the ratio is more than 1 and you can see that if you take all of these nine studies and average them using fancy statistical calculations, the people who got the e-cigarettes quit more than the people who didn't. And it's what's called statistically significant because these, these lines you see here, these are called the 95% confidence interval. That's when they talk about public opinion polling, it's what they call the margin of error. So you're pretty sure the real effect is somewhere in there. And when you put them all together, you see that you get more quitting. And this ratio doesn't include one. So it's statistically significant more quitting. So e-cigarettes as a medicine given by a doctor with counseling as part of a smoking cessation program do seem to work. But... This is looking at the population studies, uh, where, and, and this of all smokers in the real world, and each one of these lines is a study. And if you come all the way down here to the bottom, you can see that overall, there's the, it's, it's hard to read because there's so many studies. The slide is small, but the confidence interval includes one. So for among smokers in the population, E-cigarettes do not increase quitting. Smokers who use e-cigarettes are no more likely to quit than smokers who don't use e-cigarettes. So they don't have efficacy for quitting. And so, you know, if you're the FDA trying to decide, should we allow these on the market? You know, one of the arguments for putting them on the market is, well, smokers will switch to them, and that would be better because they'd sw go, stop smoking and use e-cigarettes, and that's not happening. Yes. Um, this is all smokers. We have another, since I don't want to keep you here all night, we also, that's a very good question. So we also just did a more limited analysis of just the smokers who wanted to quit and found the same thing. And um, it's actually, what the question you raise actually is very important in the debate because when, we, we, you know, when you talk to the um, e-cigarette advocates, they'll say, well, this isn't fair because you really should only be looking at the people who are trying to quit because if people don't want to quit, 
and they use these cigarettes and don't quit, then they didn't want to quit, you know, so who cares? But, you know, from, when you're the FDA and you're trying to make a judgment on that appropriate for the protection of public health standard, you really need to take all comers. Because, for example, it may be that e-cigarettes reduce people's desire to quit. Because the, in California, you can't do this because you can't use an e-cigarette anywhere indoors. You can't smoke. But there's lots of places where you can. And so people would use them to bridge, you know, where they couldn't smoke, use them. But, but if you look at the smokers who are motivated, you basically get the same finding. Yes? When you exhale an e-cigarette, what do you exhale and is it any risk to people around you? Well, yeah, well, if you've, if you've watched people use these or go on YouTube, you see them blowing something out and that's air pollution. And what, what people are breathing out is propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, flavorants, nicotine, and um, there's also heavy metals in the e-cigarette aerosol that boils off the coil. So they're putting that stuff in the air. And I'm not aware yet of any studies where people have looked at the long-term effects of secondhand exposure to e-cigarette aerosol. But there are a few studies where they've looked at, do those chemicals get into your body as a, not, as a bystander? And the answer to that is yes. And it's actually surprising because even though um, the pollution levels they create per puff are lower than a cigarette because you don't have it with a cigarette the secondhand smoke they generate part of it is the exhaled smoke and part of it is the smoke that comes off the lid into the cigarette it's called side stream smoke and you don't have any side stream smoke uh, but it it gets into the air and the levels that end up in people's bodies aren't that different from being around a cigarette smoker it's surprising but yeah, that's another problem. So I think if you're the FDA or if you're the general public saying like, well, should we be, well, should we be encouraging these things because they help smokers quit when used as consumer products? The answer is no. So I want to come back and talk a, a, a little bit more about kids because this is an, another very hot issue and I'll talk about the political battles here in San Francisco. One of the things that really attracts kids are the flavors. And there's a huge, there's probably 50 or 100 papers now written do documenting that the flavors attract kids, the flavors mask the harshness of the nicotine. And, and in fact, uh, the House just voted a few days ago to ban the sale of all flavored tobacco products, modeled on the law we passed here in San Francisco a couple of years ago. And the e-cigarette people say, no, 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 the adults need the flavors to help them quit. Well, A, they don't help people quit as consumer products, but you just can't tell me that some middle-aged smoker watched this, you know. And I don't have, I should go on the internet and find it. I was at a meeting where they were talking about research on flavors, and people were talking about unicorn poop and unicorn barf. And I thought they were making it up. But, you know, I don't have like a 12-year-old anymore. But if you, if you go on the Internet, like unicorn poop and unicorn barf is a big thing with middle school students. And they have like unicorn barf e-cigarette e liquid. And all of this has, has really worked. I mean, if you look, this is data from the CDC. And you can see the red line, the e-cigarette use has just skyrocketed among high school students. And if you look at the blue line, this one, this is cigarette smoking. And you can see it was going down. And in fact, if you extend this line all the way back about 10 or 12 years, it was pretty much going down continuously. And after e-cigarettes came on the market, the progress in reducing cigarette smoking stopped. Because what's happening, and I'll show you some more data on this in a second, is that the e-cigarettes 
are bringing a lot of low-risk kids into the market who would, if you look at their, at their psychological profile, you would think would never pick up a cigarette. And then a lot of them are then adding cigarettes. Yes. So it's, so it's $40 for, that's for a reusable one. And the pods are, how much does a pack of pods cost? Less. Less. But a pod, one of those jewel pods has about the same amount of nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. But it actually is equivalent to more than a pack of cigarettes because, again, when you smoke a cigarette, you get the side, uh, side stream smoke. So some of the nicotine ends up as air pollution. And so all of the nicotine in an e-cigarette gets in the user. So uh, a, a jewel pot is more like two or three packs of cigarettes in terms of... And kids, some kids will just sit down and suck down one of those pods in a day or a sitting. It's very scary. Yes. Yeah, the, the charger part, the bottom part is reusable and then you replace the pods. Now, there are also disposable e-cigarettes now. The new big thing with kids is something called Puff Bar, which is like a disposable jewel. Um, but, you know, th this is really bad because the, the total amount of nicotine-addicted kids is going way up, you know. And so the whole harm reduction argument and, well, these are helping adults quit is just swamped by these effects on kids. And this is a, a study looking at the or set of studies and other meta-analysis, you know, taking kids, one group of kids had none of the kids at the beginning smoked cigarettes ever. And then you take the, how many, you look a year later and say, how does the kids using e-cigarettes pick up smoking compared to the kids who aren't? And again, if the e-cigarettes didn't affect smoking initiation, that ratio would be one. And you can see all the studies, and this is a couple years old, there are many more now, they all show kids who initiate nicotine use with e-cigarettes are very likely to add cigarettes. The odds of adding cigarettes is like a factor of three or four. So it's a huge effect. And in fact... Uh, this is a study out of Dartmouth from a few years ago where they did a very thorough analysis based on the population studies and found <clears throat> making very optimistic assumptions about e-cigarettes and quitting based on the clinical trials. So this is very optimistic that for every smoker who quit, 80 kids started. And, and this is, uh, it's, it's probably way worse than that because they used a very optimistic quitting estimate. I mean, based on our work today, we would say there's no quitting benefit for adults. And this was before Juul, and Juul before the explosion of Juul use. Well, so the question, that's a, you guys ask really good questions. So this, a, the question was, were e-cigarettes invented as a way to keep people smoking? Now, I don't think the guys who invented Juul did that because they weren't part of the tobacco industry back then. Now Juul is controlled by Philip Morris, but they were out there to compete with them. But here at UCSF, we have almost 100 million pages of previously secret tobacco industry documents sitting on the Internet. Um, I'm actually the guy who brought them out. And we went in there, and it turns out that in 1994, Philip Morris had a functioning e-cigarette. And they didn't take they just they didn't take it to market at the time for political reasons, but if you look at their marketing research and the question of why did they develop it, it was exactly for what you said it was to keep people in the market, because what they were afraid of was that people were quitting smoking and they were losing them as customers, and they wanted to develop these other products to hold on to the customers, and so at the public health debate about e-cigarettes is all about using them for quitting and harm reduction and stuff like that. If you look at the tobacco company's own research of why they did this, it's all about deterring quitting. So, so where are we today? Well, um, no, I mentioned to you that there are this law that says 
If you want to sell e-cigarettes, they need to be approved by the FDA. No e-cigarette has yet been approved by the FDA. They're all on the market illegally. And, and, and that's simply because the FDA has exercised what's called enforcement discretion and said we're not going to enforce the law about e-cigarettes, even though we all, we all admit that they're illegal. We're going to let them be out there because we think they might be a good thing. And, and uh, they finally got sued by the health groups, and they are now required to start enforcing the law next May, or this coming May, in a couple of months. And they have, because of all the furor about flavors, they are using their, their supposedly taking some of the flavored products off the market, but they're just taking off the pods, the flavored pods, and, and all of the refillables, all of the disposables, they're new, doing nothing about. And, and so the, the public health community was very disappointed that the FDA didn't really come, didn't really do anything. And to this day, they haven't really done, they have a lot of legal authority, but they haven't used it. So what happened here in San Francisco? We, we are actually the epicenter of this whole argument, not just because Juul is here, but because UCSF is here. And, and uh, um, back in 2017, the, our cancer center, which I, I helped run the tobacco program in the cancer center, started working with the community as part of something called SF Can, which is a program that the cancer center has to work with the community to reduce cancer in several areas, one of which is tobacco. And we started educating the public and talking to the supervisors about flavored tobacco products and how appealing these were to kids. And if you look at that picture, it's a little hard to tell, but that's a wicker basket full of tobacco products. I know it kind of looks like a basket of candy, but it's tobacco products. And at the hearing at the Board of Supervisors over a, it was the first time there were, have been several cities which had limited the sale of flavored tobacco products or some flavored tobacco products. San Francisco was the first city to just say, we are not allowing any flavored tobacco products, e-cigarettes, little cigars, smokeless tobacco, no flavored tobacco products. And the thing that got it through, I think, was this wicker basket that a bunch of high school students brought to the public hearing, and it completely freaked out the Board of Supervisors. I mean, I was sitting there because I testified along with some other UCSF people, and it's like, why are these kids bringing a basket of candy to this hearing, you know? And then we found out this was all tobacco. Is this all regular cigarettes? Or no, these are, these are a whole range of products. Uh, cigarettes, um, uh, um, uh, menthol cigarettes, little cigars, smokeless tobacco. Uh, they have these things. They're like to nicotine toothpicks that are flavored. It's like crazy. And the, the law passed the board unanimously. The mayor signed it. And then R.J. Reynolds Cigarette Company rolled into town and spent $12 million forcing a referendum on the law. And the, the public debate was about e-cigarettes, but what Reynolds was trying to protect was Newports. They, that's the leading menthol cigarette, which Reynolds makes. Um, uh, and they were trying to protect the menthol cigarette market, but the whole thing got framed as an e-cigarette question. And, and $12 million is a gigantic amount of money to spend in a political campaign. It's way more than was spent in all the other campaigns. And it was great. Reynolds just got clobbered. They, they, it was a little bit like Michael Bloomberg. You know? <laughs> they spent this gigantous amount of money and 68% of the people said, no, we'll support the law. And it, it went into, I mean, it, it's a complicated story, but for all practical purposes, it went into effect 
in January, and this I have to update this slide, there's about 80% compliance by direct inspection. So it's not perfect, but it's working pretty well here in San Francisco. And now it's getting copied all over the country. And as I said, Congress, the House, just essentially passed the same legislation nationally. Now, whether they'll get through the Senate, who knows? So we were going along happily, you know, make, trying to make our flavor ban work. And then Jewel, you know, then what happened was uh, Shimon Walton, uh, supervisor from, from uh, the Bayview, where Jewel is based, got mad that he was still seeing kids using these products. And unlike the earlier debate, which where, where the health interest sort of went to the supervisors and said, we, we'd like you to think about this, Walton and the city attorney just said, this is And so Walton introduced a bill that said no e-cigarettes could be sold in the city of San Francisco if they didn't have an FDA approval. And at that point, and in fact today still, none of them have FDA approval. And, um, and you know, it, it wasn't an outright or isn't a ban, it's a moratorium. So if Juul or some other e-cigarette company can get through the FDA, then theoretically at least they could be sold here again. Now whether the city would say, never mind, we don't want them, I don't know. But then what happened was Juul came in with an even bigger campaign to try to overrule that. And they spent $18 million, which was 50% more than Reynolds did. Not only would it have overturned the Walton Ordinance, it would have overturned the flavor ban, it would have undermined enforcement of the Tobacco 21 law. And uh, in the end, 82% uh, of the public supported the law. So they got clobbered even worse. Now, I was so little snippy toward Michael Bloomberg, but he actually kicked in a bunch of money to help defend both of these ordinances. But, you know, and now other cities are now saying, like, what the hell? We don't need these things anymore. So these laws are also uh, spreading, and it took effect a couple months ago. So... The state of California has also been very active in this area. This is um, the, the state um, has a, uh, an anti-smoking campaign funded by the tobacco tax. And this is um, uh, one of the first of the ads they did about e-cigarettes about two years ago. And needless to say, the tobacco companies didn't like that. So I want to talk, the rest of the talk is about health effects. So, yes? The question is, you know, people don't call these things e-cigarettes. They call them Juul or vape pens or Sorens. Or, and, and it's a huge problem um, because... Well, first, so the question was, could you pass a law prohibiting people from calling them anything but e-cigarettes? The answer to that is no, because people will call them whatever they want. You know, you, you might be able to restrict what the companies could call them, but, you know, people, people say what they want to say. Um, but it's also a huge problem for researchers, because if... You know, when the CDC started tracking e-cigarette use in their national surveys, they asked about e-cigarettes. And uh, after a couple of years, they changed the question to say, have you ever used an e-cigarette or a Juul or a Blue or a this or a that? And the number of kids who said yes went way up. And, I mean, I direct a big research center, and we, one of the projects, or two of the projects, deal with, like, surveying kids about their use. And what we do now is we show them pictures. 
and say, have you used any of this stuff? Because it's just otherwise you would spend four hours interviewing them because of all the different names, and it's a, it's a problem. And that's why the, the state actually, um, that, that slide of the jewel I put up, which said this is not a flash drive, last year, maybe two years ago now, the state had a big education campaign. This is not a flash drive. This is not a bag of popcorn. This is not a, a, this is not a magic marker. This is not a pen. Just to, to, to let parents and teachers know what these things were. So, and, and they're just constantly changing. Because when you talk about a conventional cigarette or a cigar, it kind of has to be built the way it looks in order to burn it and, you know, have it work. And these are digital products, so, you, you know, you can make them look like anything you want. It's a huge problem. So anyway, getting on to the, to the question of safety, you hear a lot, I mean, you probably don't, but it drives me nuts. You hear this claim that e-cigarettes are 95% safer than cigarettes. Have any of you heard that? It's okay, well, you're, you're, you're lucky. Well, the origin, for, I mean, this gets brought up in, at, at hearings all the time, in the, in the battles over the two initiatives here, it got brought up. Well, the origin of this claim, that claim is this paper that was published back in 2014. And I went and read it, and it has no evidence in it whatsoever. It was like, it was like a dozen people getting together in a room and, and kind of scratching their head and scratching their behind and deciding e-cigarettes were 95% safer. And, and uh, it turns out that there were a huge number of people with financial ties to the industry involved. And, uh, and this number, it's like the, the economist Paul Krugman talks about zombie arguments where, you know, you keep disproving something and it keeps coming back. And this 95% number is a zombie number. So the other thing that's important to understand is, is that while you don't have the fire and you don't have the combustion products, you still have the particles. And the particles are themselves very dangerous. If we have a day uh, outdoors, we have a lot of particulate air pollution, people end up in the emergency room with heart attacks, with strokes, with respiratory problems. And, and if you look at these graphs, this is a plot of the number of particles against particle size. And these are two different e-cigarettes. And this is a conventional cigarette. And these are actually first-generation e-cigarettes. And they're a lot, the newer ones are more efficient. But notice you get a huge amount of particles. And they're actually a little bit smaller than the cigarettes. And you get those particles down deep into your lungs. They trigger inflammatory processes. They depress immune function. These particles are so small they can go through walls. So they go right into your blood, right into your cells, carry all kinds of bad things. And, and one of the big effects, as I mentioned, of breathing fine particles is heart attacks. And this is a study not of e-cigarettes, but of, of conventional smoking, passive smoking, and air pollution. And on the vertical axis here is risk of heart attack. And this is a level of exposure to, to, to particle air pollution. And you can see there's a very steep dose response curve. So even a little bit of exposure is really bad. And then as you get more, it's worse, but it gets worse at a slower level. So all of this, and then there's lots of other stuff I don't have time to get into, would lead you to think that e-cigarettes are having bad effects on your cardiovascular system. And this was the first study I saw done in people that shows that. And um, uh, just to explain uh, a little biology, this is measuring something called flow-mediated dilation, or FMD. 
So you all have arteries, right? You know that because you're in the mini medical school. And the arteries carry blood out to your muscles into your body to take oxygen out and then to carry waste products back to your lungs to be exhaled or to other organs. So you're sitting here and you don't need a lot of oxygen. You don't, you're not generating a lot of waste products. So your arteries are small because you don't need a lot of flow. Now, when you get up and walk out of here, your body's need for oxygen will, um, will immediately go up. And so your heart starts pumping harder. And if your arteries were made out of cast iron, your blood pressure would go up. And that would be bad. So what happens instead is the friction of the, of the blood against the lining of the arteries stimulates something, uh, uh, an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase, which is in the lining of the arteries. That produces nitric oxide, which diffuses down into the muscle of the arteries and makes it relax and the arteries get bigger. And this is, uh, this is actually how Viagra works. Um, uh, Viagra stimulates nitric oxide synthase in the penis and, and causes the arteries to, to enlarge and you get engorgement. Viagra was actually originally developed to treat angina, heart pain, and it, by, by doing this, but it turns out different arteries react differently and it didn't work on your heart, but they found this interesting side effect and went off and made like a gazillion dollars. So you can measure this flow-mediated dilation in people. And the, their, one common way to do it is they put a blood pressure cuff on your arm and leave it on there tight for a few minutes. That blocks the blood flow to your lower arm. So it gets, it's, becomes oxygen starved, which is called ischemia. Then you release the, the, the blood pressure cuff. The, the blood goes rushing down into your arm. And you can, there's an artery right here called your brachial artery. It's where they take blood when you get blood draws. And they can take an echo machine and measure how much bigger it gets and also how much faster the blood flows. So that gives you a direct, and this all happens within seconds. So this is a study of people, and these are non-smokers, normal people, and they measured the FMD, the flow mediated dilation, and it was about seven and a half, the arteries got about seven and a half percent bigger. Then if you look at the blue bar, they had the people smoke one cigarette, a regular plain old conventional cigarette, and you can see that the FMD gets cut about in half. The ability of the arteries to dilate is drastically cut. If you have them you smoke an e-cigarette, it's basically the same. So even though you don't have the combustion, the fact that you're getting these particles and some of the other chemicals is just clobbering vascular function. If you, this is looking at smokers, they start out with more, you know, more compromised vascular function. Their arteries don't dilate as much. But in the smokers, if you give them a cigarette or an e-cigarette, you further depress FMD, you further depress arterial function. And this has been shown, not, it's not due to the nicotine, it's something else. Now this is a really interesting study done here by my colleague Matt Springer, who measures this in rats. It's, it's basically the same kind of thing. So here's the FMD, and he, he exposed these, and he measured like the FMD before exposing them to, to Joule aerosol and after, and you can see how it drops. So this is a Joule, a fourth generation e-cigarette. This is a pen system, a third generation e-cigarette. This is a Marlboro red conventional cigarette. And then air, clean air where nothing happens. And you can see that an e-cigarette's like smoking a cigarette in terms of clobbering your vascular function. And there's tons of biology in some clinical studies now showing that e-cigarettes have essentially the same effects on the cardiovascular system as a cigarette does. Even though you don't set them on fire, but the, 
the, um, the particles, they have a lot of acrolein in them, which is very cardiotoxic. The, a lot of the flavoring agents seem to screw up the vasculature. And so all of this would make you think, well, maybe these things are going to increase the chances of having a heart attack. So we went out into the, and, and took a, did a big population study, and this is using something called the National Health Interview Survey, which is a giant survey the federal government does. And what we did is we, we again, we looked at the, at the chance of having a heart attack if you're a smoker or an e-cigarette user compared to if you're not. So if, if e smoking cigarettes and you, or using e-cigarettes had no effect, this ratio would be one. And if you go, if, just to skip out here, if you're a daily smoker, your odds of having had a heart attack are increased by about a factor of two and a half times. If you're a daily e-cigarette user, it isn't quite as much. It's maybe 2.2 times. But if you look at the margins of error, they overlap. And so in terms of heart attack risk, e-cigarettes are looking about as bad as cigarettes. And without getting into all the statistical niceties of this, these two effects are independent of each other, which means if you're a dual user, if you're both smoking cigarettes and using e-cigarettes at the same time, which is the most common pattern in adults, these two risks multiply. So it, your odds go up by about 2.5 if you're a smoker every day. If you're a daily e-cigarette user, it's 2.2, which means if you're a dual user, it's like 5, which is gigantic. So what these people who, who say, well, they talk about e-cigarettes should be used to switch, but most people who use them keep smoking. So you're actually worse off than if you were just smoking. And there's tons more to talk about on heart disease. Now, another area that's just emerging is cancer. Now, cancer takes a lot more time to be manifest than these cardiovascular effects. The cardiovascular effects start happening, like this FMD study in rats that, that Matt's done, and I've worked on some of them with him. You see that in about 15 seconds. Um, this is a study done at USC where they were looking at cancer genes. And they, were, they took cheek swabs from people, you know, just went in and uh, scraped a few cells off the inside of their cheeks. And then they looked at smokers and people who were just using e-cigarettes. And they looked at, at, at were cancer genes adversely affected. And they found that in the smokers, about uh, 1,300 uh, cancer genes were upregulated in a bad way, and about 300 were downregulated. So about 1,600, if I can see those numbers, were adversely affected. In the e-cigarette users, it wasn't quite as many, but it's still like 1,200. So you're, you're affecting a lot of cancer-related genes in a bad way. And the other interesting thing is if you actually look at the genes, only about 300 of them were the same. So this is saying that e-cigarettes look like they may be imposing a different cancer risk than cigarettes do. Now, it's way too early to know, but this is, is, is I think, very provocative, and there's been some other subsequent similar studies. Uh, this is a paper that was published about six months ago where, where they took mice and they exposed them to e-cigarette aerosol for 54 weeks and they found DNA damage and they had a, a big increase in lung cancer and they also, they didn't see an increase in bladder cancer, which is another common uh, tobacco-induced cancer, but they saw precancerous changes. So, you know, this is showing you can go into a laboratory and actually induce cancer in animals with e-cigarettes. So I think that's, like, very scary. And uh, uh, we have some work going on here uh, um, looking at the effects of e-cigarette aerosol on cancer once you get it. And that's looking very scary. 
And then finally, there's lung disease, and there's a lot of, lot of bad things in e-cigarettes in terms of lungs. The protein, pardon me, the propylene glycol vegetable glycerin carrier, it's that itself, if you, it's used for theater fog. If you ever go to ACT or something and they have fog, that's propylene glycol vegetable glycerin. And if you look at the warning on the theater fog, it's like, don't breathe this. Much less don't heat it up and inhale it directly. Um, the nicotine in the tobacco leaf has adverse effects on lungs. It, it, it's, there's beginning to be evidence that it's implicated in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. But flavoring, some of them are very toxic to lungs. Butter flavor, which is called, uh, the chemical which is used for butter flavor is called diacetyl. And that's, um, uh, uh, there's a disease called popcorn worker's lung because they had people working in a microwave popcorn factory who were developing very serious lung disease. And it was from breathing in the fumes from the diacetyl. And so if you go into a factory where they're making microwave popcorn, you have to wear a respirator. And this is an ingredient in e-cigarettes. And there are several of the flavorings, which are perfectly dandy to eat, if you aerosolize them, inhale them, really tear up your lungs. The coil, when you heat that coil up, it boils off metal ions that you breathe in, and those are bad for your lungs. And then the, the, the wick, after a while, starts to deteriorate, and little tiny pieces of wick start breaking off, and there's often silica in the wick, and that gets into your lungs. And so, um, uh, this is from one of the papers I, uh, I gave you guys to read, if you want, by Jeff Gotts. It's a really nice summary of all these lung effects. And it, you can see that the e-cigarette aerosol is affecting your respiratory tract at all levels, up in your upper airways, in your bronchus, it's creating, causing inflammation. It's, it's, it's creating all kinds of bad things down in your air sacs, the alveoli, which are very delicate where the actual air exchange happens. And so there are many, many, many ways that e-cigarettes are bad for your lungs. And so again, this would all, you lead, all lead you to think that um, you'd see an increase in disease in the population. And this was the first study that did using a big, gigantic, another one of these big federal data sets called the Population Assessment of Tobacco or Health. And they, they looked to see what was the relationship between COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and e-cigarette use either some days or every day. And they used a fancy statistical technique called propensity score matching to control for their smoking and secondhand smoke and gender and age and a bunch of other stuff. And what they found was even after you control for all that, the e-cigarette users had almost twice the odds of developing COPD as um, people who didn't use them, e on top of any smoking effect. So this is more evidence that dual use is dangerous. And then there's the so-called EVALI, the very serious lung disease that was in the news a lot. It's kind of receded because people have kind of started to get it under control. But you have heard a lot about it's the marijuana, it's the THC vapes that are causing it. And there's just, I think at this point, there is no question that the vitamin E acetate, which is used as the solvent in a lot of these THC vapes, is causing this very severe acute lung disease. Um, but, but if you look at the at the at what kind of products people are using, um, you know, most of them are vaping THC or CBD, but 13% are just using nicotine products. And most of them are using both the, e, the THC and the nicotine products. So as my pulmonary friends here say, lungs are designed to breathe air, not aerosols of ultrafine particles of oily substances 
or glycerol or, or pardon me, glycerin and propylene glycol and other things. And when you look at the Evali, it turns out one of the things that breathing in this very fine mist of vitamin E acetate, which is very oily, it gets down into your air sacs, little tiny air sacs. And in your air sacs, there are cells called macrophages. And macrophages are, are there to gobble up viruses and bacteria. They're part of your immune system. And the macrophages see these, these tiny little droplets of, of vitamin E acetate, and they say, hmm, that's not supposed to be here, and they gobble it up, and then they get all clogged up and stop working, and then they start clogging up your air sacs. And if you take samples, you can stain them with a specific stain, and there's this orange are the lipid engorged macrophages, which is a... Uh, a marker of something called lipoid pneumonia, which is very common in these patients who get Evali. But this is a really interesting study that was done. Uh, this is using animals where they exposed them to propylene glycol vegetable glycerin aerosols, the stuff that's in e-cigarettes, or to cigarette smoke. And so they, they, had, they had air they had them breathing cigarette smoke. They had them reading this ENDS, means electronic nicotine delivery system. This is the vitamin, or pardon me, the propylene glycol vegetable glycerin. And then this is adding nicotine. And if you look down here at these stains for macrophages, interestingly, for the air, you know, they're nice and clear. The cigarette smoke isn't doing anything. But if you inhale the vitamin, or pardon me, the uh, propylene glycol vegetable glycerin, you get the same kind of lipid engorged macrophages that you know you see with the vitamin E acetate. And adding the nicotine doesn't do anything, and you still get the same effect. And they were able to actually figure out, even though the chemical you're putting down is different, and the the outcome is the same, and their pathway for getting it is a bit different. But I find this like very scary. And we have work going on here at UCSF um, kind of along this line. And it's, it's just the more we learn, the more dangerous that propylene glycol vitamin E acetate looks. And then this is another study looking at, um, at uh, lung samples of people uh, who died from E Valley. And uh, they, oh, I'm sorry, E Valley is. E-cigarette and vaping-induced lung illness. I apologize. I think I've been pretty good about not using jargon. Thank you for rescuing me. So Evali is the people who are getting very sick, young people getting very severe lung disease. And it was in the news a lot last fall. And it's kind of receded now, I think, because people have been, you know, a lot of people aren't using these products as much as they were. But this is look, doing lung histology on some of the people who died. And they couldn't do the staining to, to look for the lipid engorged macrophages because they were doing two different histologic preparations. But if you read this paper, they say it looked like somebody who'd been working in a chemical refinery where there'd been an explosion. So these products were creating severe chemical burns down deep in your lungs. So they're bad. And in fact, I don't have a slide for this, but we're all very worried about the coronavirus. And, you know, one of the um, other things we've learned about both cigarette smoking and e-cigarette use is that it, if, if you inhale that stuff, your, your alveoli, your air sacs don't like it. But if you have the flu and you inhale cigarette smoke, it's way worse. So, you know, I think um, I have a blog and I'm working on something I'm going to put up to say, you know, people, if they want it, you know, in addition to washing your hands and, you know, not doing, uh, you know, uh, you know, going on cruise ships filled with infected people, 
you should like stop smoking and don't use e-cigarettes because, you know, in fact, I just read something uh, today that were in China, the death rate from the coronavirus is much higher among men than women. And, you know, it may be because of, I mean, if you don't know, men and women are different. And there are biological differences between men and women. But in China, about half the men smoke and only about 5 or 10% of the women do. And it may well be that the smoking is ex helping to explain this big difference. So you asked about secondhand smoke. And this is a campaign the state is currently running that all secondhand smoke is bad, marijuana, vaping, everything. And so, so what's the bottom line? Well, combustion isn't as important as we thought. You know, if you're breathing in an aerosol of ultrafine particles and chemicals, that's bad. Uh, we have rapid youth uptake, and they're promoting progression to cigarettes deterring quitting in adults. And but the reason I think they're deterring quitting, they're not affecting success rates, but people are using them instead of things that work. Uh, they pollute the air. Dual use is more dangerous than just smoking. There's a bunch of studies showing that now. And then Evali. And so the net effect is that, that it's expanding the tobacco epidemic. So it's making things worse. Now, finally, what do you tell a smoker who, who, who comes to you and said, I'm thinking of quitting smoking, what do you think about e-cigarettes? Or I'm using an e-cigarette. And I, I think the first thing is you say, well, you know, you should, you should, you know, good, quitting smoking is good. But for most people, the e-cigarettes are not helping unless they're being used as part of a clinically supervised program. I, uh, and there's a lot of medications out there that, if used properly, actually work pretty well. If they're combined with counseling, you need the counseling. And if they're already using an e-cigarette, tell them you don't know what's in it. There's no regulation at all of them yet, and they should stop. But if, 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 at the very least, they should stop smoking because dual use is worse than just uh, smoking. So finally, what should the policy response be? And San Francisco has really led the way on this. One is to ban all flavored tobacco products, not just e-cigarettes, but cigars, all of that stuff. Including Yes, absolutely. Whoa. San Francisco banned menthol, too. The city is still here. Menthol, menthol is probably the most evil of all the cigarette additives. That's a whole other talk. Uh, aggressive public education is good, uh, including e-cigarettes and smoke-free policies, which California has done. Another thing I think that's very important with the kids is, you know, you hear all the kids are doing it. Well, all the kids aren't doing it. 27% of the kids are doing it. That means 73% aren't. And we need to start saying to the 73%, you have a right to pee in peace. And if, if you go in the bathroom and somebody's vaping, tell them to leave. Take back the bathrooms. So this is, if you want more information written in English, this is the California Department of Public Health website on e-cigarettes. And it's very, very well done. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any other questions you have. No, I have two minutes left or two questions. So any other questions? You've asked a lot of good questions, yeah? That's a really hard question. <laughs> the, the, I, I would definitely not vape cannabis because the, you know, everybody's focused on vitamin E acetate. But because of just THC's physical properties, in order to vape it, you need to put it in an oily car carrier. And so it's probably going to have very similar effects, maybe not quite as bad. But I think vaping it is, I, nobody in their right mind should vape cannabis. Um, you know, um, if you, cannabis has a lot of the same cardiovascular effects. I mean, Matt Springer has done studies looking at cannabis, and they also clobber vascular function. Um, the problem with edibles 
is nobody knows really how to dose them. Um, and and they're the, the edibles are actually the things that we have the biggest problem with overdosing because people will eat some and nothing happens and then they eat some more and nothing happens and then they eat some more and nothing happens and then they eat some more and go to the emergency room. Whereas if you inhale it, again, it's just like with the nicotine, it gets to your brain very quickly. So it's easier to modulate the dose. But, you know, I think, uh, I mean, I think the state is making a huge mistake in the way cannabis legalization has been done. I think it should be legal. I think the war on drugs has been a catastrophe. But I think we should be treating cannabis like tobacco. It's something we put up with. Uh, you know, we're not going to throw anybody in jail for using it. But it should be heavily regulated. The, the state should not be out there doing what it's doing now, which is seeing it as some kind of cash cow. And in fact, it's not, I mean, the, the idea that cannabis is going to make the state a ton of money isn't happening. In fact, I just finished reading a book one of my former fellows wrote about the, his, the political history of tobacco. And the first third of it is about, like, farmers in the first part of the 20th century and the Depression. And they had a huge overproduction problem. That's what led to the tobacco price support program. And that's exactly what's happening with cannabis. They're producing way more of it than the market wants. And it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's like a nightmare. And the people I blame for that actually are the health groups because when Prop 64 was being written, I think had the health groups gotten involved and said, we'll get behind legalization if it's done in a way that puts help, prioritizes public health over business, we could have gotten legalization in a way, solved the, the social equity problems, and not had the mess that we've got now. So is that any more? <laughs> so the question, is Juul doing anything to make up for what they created? No. You know, in terms of what their intention was, you know, I learned from my lawyer friends a long time ago, never try to get in somebody else's head. But I can tell you that the standard startup model, which is what Jewel used, is you build a company up and then you sell it to some big multinational. And that's exact. That's what the marijuana people are trying to do, too. But, you know, I think even if you give them the benefit of the doubt, from that meeting I had with the two guys who invented it several years ago. By the time they got to commercializing it, there's no question they were out there to get kids. And, uh, and they succeeded and made a ton of money, but they created a huge mess. And, you know, the, it's interesting because the problem used to be that, you know, it was impossible to help kids quit smoking because they didn't want to. It was always like, I'll do this for a few years and look grown up and quit later. And by the time later comes around, they're addicted and then they're stuck. But now, I mean, I've met lots of high school kids who are desperate to quit. And in fact, I've uh, talked to a couple of pediatricians who are using varenicline, which is, a, which is the most powerful Smoke, me, prescription smoking medication you can use. It's, you, it's called Varenicline or Chantex is the, uh, is the brand name. And it, uh, you know, which, which uh, you know, nor, you don't, you, you only use, that's the last thing you use. It works pretty well if used properly. But who are using it off-label with kids and getting good results because I, you meet these kids and they can't go two hours without a jewel. It's just awful. Okay, one last one. I'm happy to stay, but they, they're going to turn the light off. Yeah. Yeah, so the way it works, so the question is, well, what does this have to do with acetylcholine? So the way your nervous system works is a nerve is like a wire. And there's like a ball at the end of the wire that has chemical transmitters in it. And then there, the other nerves kind of wrap around it. And that's called a synapse. And so an electrical signal comes down to your nerve. And then when it gets to the end, it causes acetylcholine to be released. And then it diffuses across the little gap to the downstream nerve. 
and then it plugs into receptor sites. It's like putting a key in a keyhole. And when, and when enough keyhole, keys get plugged in, the downstream nerve fires. Well, the nicotine, mo one end of the nicotine molecule is shaped a lot like acetylcholine, so it plugs into those receptor sites. And that, that it, so it's a stimulant. That's why smoking is an upper. And then what happens is the back end of the nicotine molecule is different, and it's, it's like the key sticks. And so now you're blocking the receptor site, because normally the acetylcholine would bind and then be released and get recycled. So then the nicotine becomes a downer. So it's a very complicated drug, because it's both a stimulant and a depressant at the same time. Well, what happens, and then I'll stop. She just got her hook out. But what, ha no, this is a very, you guys are asking great questions. What, what happens, especially if you're a kid where your brain is still developing, which goes on into your mid-20s, is like you've like muffled your nervous system by tying up some of the receptor sites with the nicotine, so your brain grows more receptor sites to try to get, it's like, I think of it, it's like if you have a speaker and you put a pillow over it, you can still hear the music if you turn it up louder. But then when you take the, the pillow away, it's too loud. That's why people, when they quit smoking, get, get like hyper. And the whole idea of nicotine replacement therapy is you put the nicotine in there to calm things down while people are making the behavioral changes. So the... So what happens is because you've grown more receptors, your body has adapted to the nicotine, and when you take the nicotine away, then your nervous system is turned up too loud. And then when you quit smoking over time, it down, the receptors never totally go away, but they go kind of uh, quiescent. But that's why people who quit smoking years ago and then have a cigarette or two will just be right back to being regular smokers, because all those... Receptors go like, woohoo, it's party time. So it's a very pernicious substance. And when you talk about marijuana, the marijuana operates through a whole different system called the cannabinoid system. But those two systems interact in ways that are not very well understood. So people who smoke are more likely to use marijuana, and people who use marijuana, like kids, now the drug kids start with is, is pot then if they start with pot, they're more likely to smoke cigarettes, too, because of not very well understood interactions. But that's what makes it, if you're a big, giant corporation, it's like, hey, this is, you get people addicted to something and can make gobs of money selling it to them. So on that, I think I'm supposed to stop. Well, thank you.